Hello, and welcome to the course. I'm Jody, your host today, and I'm speaking with Professor Jennifer Scapitone from the Departments of English and Creative Writing. Professor Scapitone is the author of several books of poetry, including most recently, The Republic of Exit 43, outtakes and scores from the archaeology and pop-up opera of the corporate dump. She's also the author of the scholarly monograph, Killing the Moonlight, Modernism in Venice, and an award-winning translator. She's here to talk to us about her career path and how she became a University of Chicago professor. Welcome to the course, Professor Scapitone. Hi, my name is Jennifer Scapitone. I'm a poet, translator, and scholar, and I also work across various of the visual and performing arts. I'm really interested in exploring questions of landscape and geography and how writing and language helps us rethink our relationship to the earth. Thanks. I'm so excited to hear more about that. Let's backtrack a minute. And when you think of yourself as a teenager, a young adult in college, Were there memories from this time in your life that you think set you on this career path? I became really interested in history as a kid when my parents came back from a trip to Italy and brought back images of the Sistine Chapel and of Michelangelo's sculptures. And I had it fixed in my mind that I needed to go to a place where the strata of history were really in evidence. And I was very focused on that. And although I didn't have any money to get to Italy, I managed to find work first at an archaeological dig sponsored by my university, where I served as one of the interpreters for a Greco-Roman excavation in the middle of Sicily. And I was actually excavating in a few different trenches. And there I discovered, for instance, a little statuette of Persephone, which really rocked my world. It was a statuette that had been left by an actor at the nearby sanctuary and that had then been discarded into an ex-cistern. And even that progression of events that a cistern had become a garbage dump, and since it was next to a theater which had a sanctuary attached to it, an actor had made a sort of offering to Persephone for a good performance, at the theater, being able to read all that into one small bust of this figure of fertility was so incredible to me that I really wanted to spend the rest of my life, you know, sort of finding those moments of illumination and finding ways to link back to the history of people that we can barely imagine. So I realize that's about history and I mentioned landscape, but with landscape comes people and animals and all the people that live on the landscape. So it's sort of hard to encapsulate what we do in just, you know, a sound bite. I'm really interested in the environment and the built environment and finding artifacts that can help us read the various strata of human and non-human habitation and how people make do with what they have and how they respond to crisis. Yeah, when I was preparing for this interview with you and looking over some of your materials, the interdisciplinarity of your work is just so clear. And so I think this crossing over the boundaries and finding it hard to pay. You know, is it history? Is it art? Is it is really interesting? Let's tell me a little bit more about your college experience. Where did you study and what were you studying then? I went to the University of Virginia, which was a big culture shock for me because I was from New York and being in the South, 
was sort of disorienting in what was probably a very instructive way. I learned a lot about the dark history of the U.S. there. And I was on a full scholarship, which enabled me to do things like go to work in Italy over the summers. It was a great place for me in the end because it wasn't too stuffy a place. I had lots of friends that were just, you know, paying their way through college, but there was a lot of innovative thinking across disciplines happening there. There was a program called Modern Studies that had been started by Richard Gordy, the philosopher, and I enrolled in that, and I found this concept of interdisciplinarity, which was sort of a new buzzword at the time, very interesting. And I always saw it as being a way to apply thinking across the arts and scholarship too. That wasn't necessarily how they saw it, but I was also <laughs> taking lots of visual arts classes and poetry classes with people like Rita Dove, for instance. And Rita what, had uh, published the book Thomas and Beulah, which was based on her ancestors and on basically archival research. So I really saw many examples at hand of how to animate the past, a past that had in many instances been brutally suppressed. Another one of my great teachers was Deborah McDowell, who taught a course on the Harlem Renaissance and who had us create an anthology of the Harlem Renaissance and think about what it meant to curate the past. And I remember making an audio compilation, which sort of montaged different um, jazz pieces with poetry by Langston Hughes and so on. And the idea of making a sort of visual and verbal and aural anthology was really exciting to me. So those are just a couple of instances, but there were really a lot of innovative teachers there. Another class that I really loved was with Eric Lott, and it seemed ridiculously focused. Its name was Culture and Society of New York City from 1840 through 1860, but we studied everything from the concept of the sentimental woman to the gangster type of Bowery Bahoy to the Hudson River School of Painting, to Dead's designs for parks. And we really began to understand how New York City became the agglomeration of culture that it is today in the middle of the 19th century. Sounds amazing. I'm like ready to go back to go back to college. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was exciting. So did you go straight to graduate school after, after UVA? Tell me about that transition. I took a pretty long time away from school. I graduated from college and one of the experiences I'd had was of hosting to a group of Tibetan monks who had come to UVA to make a mandala out of sand. And I was so entranced by their, their viewpoints and their, their calm and their joy. And I became very interested in Buddhism and meditation. And I basically thought when I graduated from college, this college education has not taught me anything about Asia. I'd studied African culture and North American culture and European culture, but I hadn't really studied the middle, the so-called Middle East or East Asia or South Asia. So I decided to move to Japan and 
I was teaching English to make my living there. I lived there for two years. And then I moved to Umbria, to central Italy, to work at a school, a small traveling school that was experimental, that was for gifted students in a program called Prep for Prep, in mostly in New York City. And I ended up spending almost two years in central Italy teaching English and also teaching Italian and Italian translation and leading tours through medieval hill towns and such. And by the time these four years were over, I had practically forgotten English. And then I was ready to take the GRE <laughs> in English literature and in English, which was still required at the time for most programs. And I really did feel after having learned Japanese and been speaking in Italian, that I had forgotten the English language. It had been sort of turned inside out for me, which was also a very explosive time intellectually as well, just the process of thinking in other languages for long periods of time. And it's part of what I'm interested in now anyway. But I didn't go back to school until after that. Then I applied from New York and I ended up going to Berkeley to get my PhD. Wow, it sounds like a really fruitful time in your life. Those are, sounds like amazing experiences. And I know for a lot of students, I know you weren't in, in school at that time, but that studying abroad and, and stretching, your, stretching yourself that way is, can be very important and fruitful. I did end up studying in Perugia and part of the time, and I was also studying Japanese, but it was difficult to be without intellectual bearings. And I think that it underscored that I really wanted the structure of a program. I had intended to, to enroll in an intensive Japanese course, but I couldn't raise enough money to get a visa, a student visa, mm -hmm. because I went to Bali and then this intensive course opportunity that I had to teach fell through. And so there were lots of mishaps along the way, which I think is also character building. At the time, it was enough to convince me slowly that going to graduate school would be a very satisfying way of carving out a trajectory for myself where I could be basically adequately challenged intellectually. It was hard for me at the time. This was practically before the internet. The mm. internet came out literally the last month that I was in Japan. So you have to imagine trying to learn Japanese without the aid of not only no cell phones, but without the internet. It was really a very different scene than to travel. You were really removed from your bearings and you really had to build from the ground up. And it was difficult to find other people with whom to converse about the things that mattered to you. So teaching English was not, you know, that intellectually satisfying for me, although mm. it was very interesting to confront, for instance, the Japanese style of pedagogy in language instruction and to try to introduce these reforms and to build a community with other women teachers in the public high schools there was pretty exciting because it felt like an activist thing to do. But mm -hmm. by the end of all that time, I was quite happy to be going to grad school. Yeah, so tell me about, I mean, I'm, I'm so fascinated by this, like the tension between structure and unstructure. And, you know, you're talking about being in this world, this landscape without the internet. And in some ways that opportunity to get lost has been taken away from us, but it seems to be part of your work, like being able to be immersive in a place. 
Yes. In fact, I ended up writing a dissertation about what it's like to be in Venice, or at least what it used to be like to be in Venice, to be immersed in a confounding labyrinthine landscape. I was really interested in what being in such a place, which is literally disorienting, does to the mind and to thought. So I, you know, wanted to explore that, although it wasn't really, there was no roadmap to how one writes a study of such a thing. Mm. There were some books like The Poetics of Space and The Production of Space by Henri Lefebvre and Gaston Bachelard, but there wasn't really a study of how being in a particular cityscape conditions thought or culture. So that's what I set out to do. So it really was a study of immersion in particular spaces and how that alters the forms in which we think. I can imagine coming from New York, that is such a particular place that having that foundation. Yeah. Like, I mean, I always go back to my own time there living, visiting, and that there, there is like a frame of mind that you're in that's just different from so many other places. Yeah. So I did end up writing a little bit about the difference between being in a very controlled, rationalized grid structure where you can always sort of figure out where you are according to the number of an avenue of a, or of a street, except in the most you know, ancient parts of New York City, of course, and its difference from being in a landscape like Venice. So tell me a little bit more. We sort of jumped ahead to your dissertation. Can you talk a little bit about selecting Berkeley and, and the process for you of applying to graduate school? And, you know, what, what was it that you that drew you there and what were you looking for in a program? Yes. So when I was researching graduate schools, it was very important to me to find and choose a school where I could be both a writer, a creative writer, and a scholar, and where I could find an art community. So I applied to schools, strictly to schools that had writing programs and that in some way integrated creative thinking and scholarly thinking. I was a little bit overly optimistic about how those things might be integrated, but when I found out that I got into Berkeley, I really immediately was found there. It was also the landscape of California, which I'd always longed for, and which was an education in itself. Mm -hmm. And the history of Berkeley as a place of student activism and place that had pioneered in various ways, like from the free speech movement to curbside recycling, a lot of interesting things, a lot of interesting civic and campus experiments had taken place on that on that campus. So that's where I knew I wanted to go. And I ended up being able to get a master's in creative writing at the same time that I was pursuing my PhD. And I was able to study with people like Lynn Higinian, the poet, and the scholar Charles Altieri, who truly regards poetry as a means of thinking, as a form of philosophy, and takes it very seriously. So it was a great place for me to go, and it really gave me a lot of room to be an independent thinker. Yeah, it sounds like a program that was designed for you. <laughs> so it was a great place. And yeah. I also worked with the art historian T.J. Clark, who is a an absolutely brilliant reader of texts and of paintings 
and um, who is able to see history and politics in seemingly the most formalist aesthetic experiments. So I learned a great deal from TJ Clark as well. So tell me a little bit about how all of this, how all of these experiences show up in your work at the University of Chicago and your teaching and your research. I have always found a home at Chicago because it really does embrace interdisciplinary thinking. Nearly all of my colleagues in English are cross-listed with other departments. And I have really embraced that and my books have become more and more interdisciplinary as a result of having so much support on that score. Lately, I have become interested in pushing more and more outside the boundaries of classroom experience. And so I've started pedagogical experiments like in an undergraduate course in what we call the big problems curriculum on sensing the Anthropocene with the visual artist Amber Ginsberg, which was a three week intensive course held 100% out of doors where we did things like paddle down the Bubbly Creek section of the Chicago watershed, notorious for its role in the jungle and for its pollution, but which is being cleaned up now and collecting garbage with the students, but also having them do plein air drawings and writings from canoes <laughs> and taking the students to the BP refinery in Whiting, Indiana, to think about the soundscape there and the air and just to try to marry sense experience with all that they have so illustriously learned in school. The University of Chicago is really known for its core curriculum. So people are studying a very innovative approach to the great books. But what we don't do so much of is to trust our intuition or our senses to give us new ways of thinking about the world. So one of my beefs with adult education is that learning from nature, for instance, seems to end when one graduates from elementary school. Mm -hmm. And we did things like take them on a foraging walk where the foraging specialist and artist Jenny Kendler pointed out about 25 different species of plants in Jackson Park, just right off the Midway Place on, so right near the campus, and told us all about their common names, their Linnaean names, their utility in cooking, in medicine, in pigmentation, and so on. And the students were so excited by these marvels, these botanical marvels, which they likely, very likely pass by mm -hmm. each day when they're coming to campus. So this course is the latest instantiation of, you know, my desire to just be more urgent and immediate about my teaching and just a lot more fun as well, <laughs> you know. So I pose myself the question of what a Montessori education would look like at the university level at the level of, you know, the University of Chicago and we're figuring it out. I also like to teach creative writing in a slightly different way, not by trying to train the students to make perfectly publishable poems, but 
by training them to make their own books with some very simple techniques from regular old zines to concertina books that they can make out of any sheet of paper and create the discursive communities that they want to create by self-publishing and by redefining the form of the book to suit the content that they want to create. So I taught the book as poetic form last fall, and I think it was really successful. And we had all kinds of different books, books that came in boxes, books that looked like boom boxes and were oral books that had lots of different scented objects inside, books with all sorts of fold outs. And the students were very talented writers, but a lot of them said that it had sort of blown apart what language could do for them. So I was really happy about the community that created and also the way forward for these young people who often just think, okay, there is a set of rules that I have to follow and I need to make this, you know, milestone. I need to jump through this hoop and this hoop, and then I'll be published in the New Yorker, and then I'll get a tenure track job. And in fact, careers are a lot more zigzaggedy than that. And especially the career of an artist or of a thinker who wants to be innovative. Pretty much everyone that I really idolized did things in a way that wasn't recognized when they were in the middle of doing it. They may have even felt lost or they would have felt lost had they not created their own discursive community with, within which to share ideas. If they had just been following the rule books, they wouldn't have produced any sort of marvel, but the marvels really come when you trust yourself enough to take some missteps and get lost and do something sort of outrageous that scares you and maybe scares other people too. But if you just have one or two people that really hear you, uh, which is what, you know, happens when you get like someone writing about your work in a really meaningful way and you feel really heard, that's enough. And it can be really hard to get that across to people because we're so anxious about making it and there's so much uncertainty in the economy and so on. It really seems like you're supposed to follow a certain path or you might just be forgotten or fail. Yeah. Yeah. I hear that loud and clear. <laughs> and I think that's amazing advice for young scholars, for others who might be listening to this, wherever they might be on their educational or professional journey, journeys or intellectual journeys. As we come to a close, I, I just wonder if there are any final thoughts you have as you reflect back on your career so far in your time with the University of Chicago, any highlights or things you're looking forward to in the future? I am excited about the revival of the Once Dissolved Geography program as a new interdisciplinary and interdivisional entity called the Committee on Environment, Geography, and Urbanization, which really puts people working on the most pressing problems or some of the most pressing problems that we face right now from climate change through environmental injustice, through pollution. And I'm really excited to be collaborating across disciplines with the folks from that new program. We just launched it. The acronym is SIGU for Committee on Environment, Geography, and Urbanization with a couple of roundtables. And, you know, there's 
so much that we need to figure out and quickly in order to get ready for some of these radical changes in weather patterns, in, in health outcomes for people growing up around toxins and so on. And it's I can tell that it's really important to the student body as well. And so I'm just happy to be able to have that opportunity. And I think for my upcoming spring course on writing and social change, I will be taking the students to the field station at Warren Woods, which is an old growth forest that was preserved only due to the activism of the local community, that stretch of dunes and forest and that succession of ecosystems was saved thanks in part to the actions of one of the founders of ecology at the University of Chicago, Professor Coles. So I'll also be, you know, excavating a little bit of institutional history through that with my students. Thank you, Professor Scapitone, for your time today. And course takers, if you're enjoying listening to today's interview, please check out the other ones. Leave us a comment, subscribe, follow and share this episode with your friends and family. You can find out more about the University of Chicago through uchicago.edu or the university's campus in Hong Kong through uchicago.hk. Stay tuned for more. See you around.